Welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm Matt Manicharian, former NFL scout and now of Sports Info Solutions, joined by Aaron Schatz, the godfather of football analytics and the founder of Football Outsiders. As always, we've got our producer, Justin Stein, with us. And later in the episode, we will have a very special segment with Alex Vigderman on introducing a new feature on SportsInfoSolutionsBlog.com, the number one quarterback in the world rankings. So, uh, yeah, Aaron, Alex put together a ranking system based on Bill James' old number one starting pitcher in the world rankings, um, and it kind of is a little bit of a, of a rolling average. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later in the show. I'm going to just guess that your first pick, the original number one quarterback in the world, is Jake Luton. <laughs> Very close. It's it was it was Luton and Mahomes neck and neck. Luton somewhere within a hundred of the top, I think. Yeah, somewhere in the, in the top hundred. So it's a fun list, though. It's good for kind of debates. It's obviously an impossible question to answer, but it's a lot of fun debating and trying to figure out, you know, how how the guys stack up. At least basing it on just a statistical system. I don't think Kansas City fans think it's a very impossible question to answer. I think they think it's a very easy question to answer. Yeah, I, I guess maybe I don't disagree with them. I was happy to see that the the rankings, which we didn't try to gerrymander or rig too much. Oh, terrible choice of words. Um, <laughs> the results were it came out Mahomes very, very cleanly. So those Kansas City fans will agree with me on that one. All right, let's get into the most important games of the week, though, um, because we just got to talk about some football today. So. By far, you said there was a number one most important game of the week. I don't think it'll be a shock to anybody, but what do you got? Oh, yeah. This game has such implications for the who makes the Super Bowl this year, given how strong both of these teams are. Uh, Sunday night football, New Orleans at Tampa Bay is just huge. Uh, when New Orleans wins, they make the Super Bowl 25% of the time, 13% if they lose. Tampa Bay makes it 37% of the time if they win, 23% if they lose. So this is just a gigantic game for two of the biggest Super Bowl contenders with the two oldest quarterbacks in the league. It should be a fascinating contest. Yeah, it should be a really interesting game. I think it was two of, if not the only two, maybe two of the three teams in the league that are top 10 on offense and defense in DVOA. Yes. And you know, what else can you ask for with Brady and Breeze, the 40-year-olds competing for the driver's seat in the NFC South, as you mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. And not the driver's seat in the whole NFC because of Seattle and Green Bay, obviously doing pretty well, too, but a pretty good driver's seat. You know, it's obviously important to have a home game rather than be a wild card and have to go on the road. But this game also just tells us a lot about how good these teams are and which team is better than the other. And I think the biggest problem for New Orleans is their coverage this year. They've been dismal covering wide receivers. They're number 29 against number one receivers, 32nd against number twos, and 26th against what we call other receivers. So they excel at covering running backs and tight ends. They excel at getting to the quarterback, where they're fourth in adjusted sack rate, and they're fourth against the run. But you can pass on them to their wide receivers, and uh, Tampa Bay has got some wide receivers. Chris Godwin probably is not coming back for this game, but guess who is? Antonio Brown. Unbelievable. And, uh, you know, I was looking at it exactly the same. The Saints have been the second to worst team in man-to-man coverage so far this year. So that's out of cover zero, cover one, and two man. They're only better than the Titans, who have just traded away or waiver-wired their whole secondary um, to try to rebuild that. So I looked at that and I see the Bucs, meanwhile, have fared very well against man coverage. You know, with all those weapons, of course, they're a team that's going to fare well against man, but they have been relatively middling against zone. So one of the interesting matchups that I'm looking for here is to see if Dennis Allen will sit in a lot of zone coverages, kind of trying to sort of bend but don't break um, and create turnovers uh, rather than embrace what the Bucs do well and what the Saints do poorly by playing a lot of man coverage. I think if that's the case, as as unfortunate as it might be for people looking for a Brady Breeze shootout, it could become a run game, a running game uh, type battle where if you're sitting back in zone, whoever can control the line of scrimmage against seven men in the box might have a strategic upper hand. Well, both of these are really good run defenses, though. So that's a running running game day may not be the offensive shootout that people want out of this game. 
You mentioned a little bit earlier that the uh, winner of this game is going to be much more likely to have a home playoff game. And I thought that was a really great point, especially when looking at Drew Brees and how the the Saints offense performed last week in Chicago. Uh, They got the win, but it was it was rough. We talked a lot about how it could be Alvin Kamara centric and Alvin Kamara might as well have been the sun in the solar system for this game on the Saints offense. But the battle with Roquan Smith did not let down. And this week, it's Levante, David, and Devin White that Kamara has to, has to deal with. So there's two of them that are kind of right there in the, same, in the same sort of stratosphere as Roquan Smith. I think it's another one that should just be an awesome matchup. Yeah, if the Bucks have a weakness on defense, it might be covering tight ends. They're 19. That's not really bad. That's like average. But it's like the worst thing they do on defense. So I don't know if maybe this is a big Jared Cook day. Could be Jared Cook day. Also, uh, you know, Breeze, we talked about the struggles last week. Part of that's also three the three top receivers being injured. We only knew two of them were going to be out when we talked last week. Three of them were out. It looks like three of them are going to be back. So, you know, they'll be facing against the Bucks defense. That's been a really heavy zone coverage scheme defense this year. And I'm curious to just see if, if having those guys back, like you mentioned, having Jared Cook, obviously Kamara is going to be a big part, although he's had a little bit of a health issue too. But um, the Saints have played pretty well against zone this year. Not great, but not terrible. 28 expected points added, 74% completions, and 7.6 yards per attempt. So going against this zone, having those guys back will be huge for them. But I really do think Coach Payton's going to have to have something up his sleeve because the defense of the Bucs has so much speed, and they want to sit in zone. And Drew Brees, especially outdoors, even in Tampa, especially outdoors, has a hard time taking the top off the defense at this point in his career. He's on the injury list with his shoulder this week, although, you know, they say it's routine maintenance. I'm really curious to see what the Saints can do, what what sort of cleverness they can have in order to find a way to kind of break apart that zone. Because with all that team speed and the lack of a vertical stretch, that, that's a tough, that's a tough matchup. Yeah, I mean, listen, what the Saints have been doing all year is what the Saints do, which is they just kill you with these constant five and six and seven yard passes. Right. And they've been doing that, and they've been getting guys open. So against the zone, they'll probably get guys open for those five- and six- and seven-yard passes. But it's like if they get to third and three, can you stop them from just doing that again? It'll be a great matchup. I I could see this game going a lot of different ways, but uh, mostly I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it. Here's my weird stat, by the way, about this one, weird stat of the week. The Saints are top 10 rushing team on first and third down. They're dead last rushing on second down. I always wonder what that means. Whenever there's a weird second down split, I always wonder, is there something about second down that makes it like particularly different from first down that those splits represent something real or is it just random variation? You know, something that uh, you remind me of when I talk to coaches, they're more interested in understanding like run, run, pass, run, pass, run, the kind of the, the sequencing of the series than I ever expected they would be. It always seemed like, okay, that's, that's like a thing that you could look at, but it never occurred to me that that would be particularly relevant unless there was like an obvious pattern there. Um, I'd be shocked if the Saints aren't doing the self-scouting that I know they do to look into those sorts of splits. But, you know, intuitively you'd think maybe it's second and tens and, you know, the second and 10, you know, they're going to run sort of a thing. So meanwhile, running on first and 10 is a really great time to run the ball, relatively speaking. So Maybe it's something like that, but you'd be shocked if, if the, the Saints aren't self-scouting that. Yeah, it's just one of those weird splits that I always wonder, like, does second down mean something? You know, because, for example, second and shorts provide this, all, uh, this possibility of doing anything you want. Mm-hmm. Like, are second and shorts particularly important because the offense has so many possible things they could do? Do they tell us something that other plays don't? I don't know the answer to that question. A wise man once told me, splits happen. That's true. <laughs> that was you. I'm the wise man? <laughs> All right. Go. Good for me. All right, wise guy. Let's get into the second most important game of the week. This one also for Super Bowl odds. Baltimore at Indianapolis. Baltimore makes it to the Super Bowl 15% with a win, 10% with a loss. Indianapolis 12% with a win, 8% with a loss. And I mean, I think uh, the big matchup here is the Ravens offense has struggled passing the ball in the last few weeks, especially. They're second in DVOA running, but they're down to 24th passing. 
And Indianapolis's defense has been really strong this year, but especially their zone defense against the pass. So can Lamar Jackson get it back together and pass the ball here? Especially to Mark Andrews. Indianapolis is fifth in the league against tight ends. Yeah, it's a tough matchup for the Ravens, and it's even tougher because of what's going on with their offensive line. This is what I really wanted to dig in for this game. They haven't been the same team up front this year, and I think when people want to look at Lamar Jackson, I know Bryce Rossler is writing a piece about Lamar Jackson and his you know perceived struggles so far this year. I haven't uh, had a chance to review that one yet, but that should be up on uh, Sharp Football Analysis by the end of the day. But looking at, at this game, I think it's the offensive line. And now you've got two of their offensive linemen going on IR this week. So what does this mean? Ronnie Stanley's out, and the Ravens need to hope that they don't go the same way as the Titans offense without Taylor Lewan because the Titans offense has been even worse than I think we expected when we knew that that would, would have an impact on them. Orlando Brown has moved from right tackle to left tackle. So this is actually one of those injuries that actually affects two positions because in my opinion, Orlando Brown is a real plus at right tackle. We had him as one of the best right tackles in the league last year, but he's kind of an unknown on the left side and not an, as natural a fit. Meanwhile, when you flip over to the right side of the line, the other injury is to Tyree Phillips, who's their rookie, who's really struggled this year, filling in for Marshall Yonda. So Marshall Yonda's retirement, that happened already before the season. Phillips has nine blow blocks already, while Yonda had just eight the entire 2019 season. Now Patrick McCarry slots in at right guard, and they'll move DJ Fluker into right tackle to fill in for Brown. And while the good news is both of those players have lower blown block rates than Phillips, they have the second and third highest blown block rates on the team. So between Ma- Yonda retiring and the injuries on this offensive line right now, I think it's a real problem for Baltimore, especially in the past game. And I think it's going to be a really hard thing for them to do it through the air against this Colts defense. Yeah, I agree. And and the offensive line is important. And I think Yonda has played a role. The loss of Yonda has definitely played a role in Lamar Jackson not being as good this year. Looks like a defensive battle on paper. I think both both defenses really have good answers for what the opposing offense is like to do. Um, some potential injuries, not sure if T.Y. Hilton's going to play. That could be something that, that handcuffs the Colts a little bit offensively, although I think Marlon Humphreys, for his part, is also uh, going to be out. So so we'll see how it all shakes out. But, but I think, uh, you know, this one should be a physical, physical football game. So if you like old quarterbacks, you could watch that first game. If you like just just uh, the, the pounded out mano a mano type stuff, then I think this is the game for you. Yeah, the Colts offense is very meh. It looked at DVOA in play down combos, like first down runs, first down passes, second down runs, second down pass, et cetera. And they're between 12th and 22nd in all those combos. Like they don't stand out in any of them, either good or bad. Their offense is just kind of just kind of there. Yeah, they're kind of they're still kind of finding their footing with Rivers. We're halfway through the season. It started off a little bit ugly. And it's kind of, uh, it, it settled into something, but I, I still think they're finding their identity offensively. Yeah, I mean, throws to Naheem Hines, throws to the run, running backs, that's a big part of their identity. Uh, that's actually what Film Room is about on Football Outsiders this week, is about the Colts throwing to their running backs. Uh, the receivers have not been what we expected. Michael Pittman being injured, Paris Campbell being injured, now T.Y. Hilton being injured. So, Yeah, that, that always makes it more difficult. All right, let's keep it moving, and let's talk about the biggest games for playoff odds. So this surprised me that this came out as the biggest playoff odds game because one of these teams does not have a good chance at the playoffs, but their season is basically over if they lose this game, and that's the Los Angeles football Clippers, also known as the Chargers. So Las Vegas at the Chargers. Chargers make the playoffs 22% if they win, 5% if they lose, but it's more important for Vegas. 55% if they win, 28% if they lose. And you were talking about, you know, we're going to do a segment on the number one quarterback in the world, Derek Carr, shockingly good this year. So the Raiders are 27th running the ball and 31st defending the ball, but 8th passing the ball. Yeah, shockingly, he is he slots in at number four. Um, the biggest surprise on our, on our... Yeah, not to steal Alex's thunder, but I mean, I, I have Derek Carr rated well you guys have Derek Carr rated really well yeah and he was really efficient last year everybody knows that he liked to dink and dunk but they've got some more vertical now going on that team and they've been really good raise your hand if you had Nelson Aguilar as the breakout vertical receiver of the year so bizarre and I didn't have it when he did it in like 2017 either like he's had 
what's with he talk about manic he's been great seasons and and just at drop city um so but uh on the on the raiders front based on all they were doing offensively we thought raiders browns was going to be a high scoring game and the way that actually shakes out 45 mile an hour wins there were only 13 total possessions in that game has dboa ever seen anything like that I, that is a pretty low one. I will fully admit that that's pretty low. I don't have a database of possessions per game, but that is low. Yeah, I saw the Browns had six total possessions. I've seen halves where teams have more possessions than that. So it was fascinating to see there. Dallas would have had 15 possessions and a half, and they would have turned the ball over on five of them. Um, you mentioned Derek Carr and how he's been performing well. Justin Herbert on the other side of things has been a guy that's been really interesting to me. We had him as the third quarterback in the football rookie handbook, and he went third of the quarterbacks in the NFL draft. But he's really caught some people's attention so far this year, made some flash plays, has looked really good with his deep ball accuracy. Um, is there any insights that, that can be gleaned from, from DVOA or from, or from the Football Outsiders stats on Herbert and, and what they think of his performance so far? Because there have been some turnovers as well. Yeah, the Chargers offense is dramatically slanted towards the pass. They're seventh passing the ball, 26th running the ball. So, I mean, I agree with you. Herbert's been great. I think there's a little bit of an Alvin Kamara effect in that it's making us look at his college coaches and going, how come they could do this with him? Yeah. Like, how how did the Oregon coaches make Herbert look like a lot of people were questioning him coming into the draft? Like, what were they doing that they couldn't make him look this good because he looks great for the Chargers. We were watching uh, in scout school last night, uh, you know, with all the video scouts we do, we do traditional scout school where, where I go through all the different things that, that we do inside the league scouting. And uh, we were looking at uh, an Auburn receiver and, you know, it's one of these typical Auburn offenses that just doesn't know the left hand from the right hand, what they're doing. There's no plan. There's no real usage for anybody. Uh, and the quarterback is very limiting. And the guys are asking me, you know, how come we're watching a receiver and they're saying, you know, when it, when a team doesn't want to really get the ball to a player this much, is that something that you look at as a scout? And I said, yeah, it's something that I look at as a scout. I, I want players whose coaches want the ball in their hands, but at the same time, everybody was burned by Alvin Kamara on that one. I know. Usually usage is a really good guidance. Usually, especially running backs, usage is a really good guidance for who the best player really is. But there are times where it's not, and guys get used badly. I mean, another one is why wasn't there more DK Metcalf? In the, I mean, I guess partly because he had to share with AJ Brown. Some share, some injury, but but yeah, also you know lack of quarterback play. All of these things fit in together. So it's interesting though, and certainly I would say so far Justin Herbert has exceeded every expectation that I had because it wasn't just you know production. It's, it was really the scouting breakdown. You saw the arm talent with him, no doubt about it, but I didn't see the decision-making, the processing that I thought – I didn't think he could quicken up enough to be on the NFL level. So maybe credit Anthony Lynn for simplifying things for him and for putting him in the best position to succeed, or maybe um, he's just better than, than we thought he was. I mean, they're definitely not doing that thing. You know, the classic, like what they did with Flacco and Ryan as rookies, where you depend on the running game to like prop up your rookie quarterback and give him easier reads. They're not doing that. They are not very dependent on the running game at all. They are letting Herbert sling it. Well, that's a great segue to the fourth most important game of the week because Miami had Tua start his first game last week, and he certainly was buoyed by a defense, and they trusted him to just be a game manager, certainly. Yeah, let's hope that Tua has a much better second game only because I'm forced to start him in one of my fantasy leagues where Dak Prescott got hurt and Joe Burrow has a bye week. Arizona makes the playoffs 77% of the time if they win this game, 59% if they lose. Miami, 52% with a win, 31% with a lose, uh, loss. And Tua was awful in his first start, honestly. Three yards per play. Miami struggled to run the ball. They just dominated on defense and special teams. Yeah, I think it was a it was a real like game script sort of game where the defense was just the defense basically scored four touch defense and special teams. They had a return touchdown on special teams, a return touchdown on defense, and then two more where they got like to the one yard line or something like that. So it's like Tua was not good, but then instead of having a second half to turn it around and be good, 
they just were like, okay, shut that down. <laughs> We've got a big lead. Like, there's no need for you to prove anything here. Like, we got a lead. Yeah, we got the lead. We'll go three and out. I, you know, I think that strategy can come to bite you when you're just up 18 points and you're just kind of taking the air out of the ball. We've seen that happen to the Falcons like every other week. It was, it wasn't a, so we'll see, I guess. I think the, there's still a lot to be written as far as Tua goes uh, based on that game. One thing that'll hurt him is that Miles Gaskins, who's been the Dolphins running back, he was just placed on IR. Similarly, on the Cardinals side of things, there's no Kenyon Drake for the Cardinals, so no Miami homecoming game there. So all eyes on Kyler and Tua. Yeah, here's an interesting stat. Arizona, 13th passing the ball, but fourth running the ball. And Miami's run defense is the worst in the league, but their pass offense is third in the league right now. So you might think that's really big Chase Edmonds game. But actually, Arizona is only 21st in adjusted line yards. And the biggest difference between adjusted line yards and DVOA for running is that adjusted line yards is only looking at the running back. So that shows you just how important Kyler Murray is to their run offense. And I'm not talking about scrambles, although the scrambles are important. He has more scramble yards than I think anyone else this year. But I'm talking about the planned runs, like both between scrambles and planned runs. Like Kyler Murray is just a huge, huge part of the Arizona running game. And because of that, I think you see something strategically that I wanted to dive into. For all the attention received by Brian Flores for being in cover zero against Jared Goff last week, and yes, the Dolphins did some, <laughs> they were toying with Jared Goff's heads. Talk about you know seeing ghosts out there. Brian Flores absolutely has Jared Goff's number. But the Dolphins secondary has really made an interesting transition from being almost exclusively man early in the year to being a primarily zone team. Even in this last game, they were primarily zone. And opponents have negative 38 expected points added against that Dolphins zone so far this year. That's the lowest total in the NFL. Now, tying back to what you were just saying, I think this bodes well for them against Arizona because Arizona sees almost exclusively zone coverage because of teams looking to keep eyes on Kyler in the run game. So I think that matchup might play into Miami's hands in that Miami has sort of become a team that wants to be a little bit more of a zone team. And I think when you play against the Cardinals, that almost has to be your MO because of what Kyler, you, know, you can't spy the guy. You need to keep eyes on him. Although zone, I wonder, are you asking for death by a thousand DeAndre Hopkins? Guys? <laughs> that is certainly possible. The Cardinals, meanwhile, for their part, they lead the NFL in man coverage snaps. So by the same token, you know, Tua's got some mobility himself. I wonder if he can use his mobility to kind of break their man coverage a little bit and potentially force the court Cardinals into more zone looks, which is what they don't want to do as much. So there might be something there. Yeah, Arizona's pass defense This is also interesting. Second in the league against deep passes, that's 16 or more air yards, but 24 against short passes, that's anything up till 15 air yards. So uh, Tua may be better off not looking for the big shot, but going short, hitting a lot of these 11, 12-yard type slants to Monte Parker. It'll be a fun matchup to watch. For, we talked about Breeze and Brady. I'm even more excited about Kyler and Tua. Yes, as uh, UniWatch has pointed out, the website UniWatch, this looks like it is the first matchup in NFL history between two quarterbacks wearing the number one. Interesting. I thought you were going to say like below six feet tall or something like that. <laughs> Who are also below six feet tall and young. <laughs> is Tua below six feet tall? I don't think he is, actually. I think he's No, I think he's like a little taller. All right. We'll look forward to it. We'll take a quick break, and then we'll come back in with that number one QB in the world segment that we teased. SISBets.com is back for 2020. And if you didn't make use of it last year, you missed out on easy money. SISBets.com is an advanced prop betting information tool powered by Sports Info Solutions. With it, you can leverage the power of our proven projections models to find value against the odds. You're never more than a few clicks away from knowing whether your favorite wide receiver is likely to score a touchdown this week or whether a quarterback that you have your eye on is likely to go over or under his completions prop. Just choose the bet type, the player, and the money line to see the SIS Bets recommendation. SISBets.com is available for just $9.99 per month, so it easily pays for itself, and that price covers both football and baseball. That means you can also take advantage of our most popular bet type, home run projections, which our users rode to a very solid 12% ROI in 2019. Sign up at SISBets.com. All right, up next, we have a very special treat. 
Alex Vigderman is our lead football researcher. He also does plenty of great work on the baseball side, and he has developed a new rankings list that we want to get into a little bit here. So, Alex, what is the ranking and where did it come from? Sure. So we're calling it the world's best quarterback ranking. And this is in line with something that Bill James came up with and has had for a long time on the baseball side of things in terms of the world's number one starting pitcher. Uh, It's maintained on Bill James online and, and we sort of control the code for that. And what it basically does is it allows us to get a ranking of all of the starting pitchers over time. And a player, you know, jumps in at the bottom of the ranking or at some flat number. And then as he accumulates playing time and performs well or poorly, he moves up and down the ranking. And essentially, it allows us to get a longer time scale version of evaluating who are the best pitchers at this moment in time. We wanted to take that idea and move it to quarterbacks. And, you know, the underlying structure obviously has to be different because we're using different stats and all that kind of stuff. But also the fact that we're really only talking about a few dozen quarterbacks who are relevant at any given point in time compared to uh, you know, several starting pitchers per team in Major League Baseball. The considerations have to be a little bit different. Obviously, also only having 16 games is in a season is a little bit different, um, but we wanted to essentially use what we have as a way of evaluating players using total points and turning that into a ranking system that is a little bit, obviously, the good players are going to look good, bad players are going to look bad, but having a little bit of an understanding of how we should take into account performance from multiple seasons ago, recent performance, and how we should weight those, uh, making sure to consider that as well. One thing that I love about kind of working at SIS, many of our best ideas, I think, do come from paying attention to what Bill James has done in baseball, what, what, what's been done in other sports. And I love that Mark Simon came out and said, hey, we've got this best starting pitcher ranking. Can we make something for, for QBs? You talked a little bit about the sort of uh, the challenges that you face going from a, a best pitcher, a best you know best pitcher in the world ranking to something that's obviously a different sport. What were the key decisions that you felt like you had to make when you were putting this together and and creating the system? I, I know the Bill James system is pretty rough on pitchers that are injured or don't perform for whatever reason for a while. So that kind of inactivity is a weird question we don't usually answer. the The biggest things are definitely related to players who appear from nowhere and and are excellent or are good for a while, miss time, and how do we sort of evaluate the missed time? So the the core structure of that is basically that we progress a player's, the the weight of a player's games by the amount of time that's passed between those games. So sort of, you can think of it as the most recent game is the highest weighted game. And then the game before that is weighted essentially seven days less and each game, as you go back, is weighted less and less and less until the the game from three years ago is weighted as zero. And so we essentially use a smooth distribution of weights from three years ago to the present with a little bit of an exponential aspect in there. So the, the most recent game is more relevant compared to the game before that than two previous games are. Makes sense. Uh, you know, if you think about it, it's kind of two offsetting things, like two offsetting effects happening. The most the most recent game is the most important, so you get kind of that that recency effect. But also, because the list goes goes back and considers things that happened seasons ago, there's also a stubbornness for the rankings to move, even even with that that weighting of the most recent game. Yeah, and we combine the stubbornness concept with essentially any game that a player misses that wasn't just because their schedule made it so that they don't you know their team doesn't have a game. Any game that you actually miss, whether it's by injury or being benched or whatever you're sort of treated as a replacement level player for any of those games. So for a game or two, that's not going to make much of a difference, especially when we're talking about as big of a time scale as we're looking at. But for players who miss big chunks of seasons, uh, you're going to see them sort of slowly drop through the rankings, as opposed to something where you might, in in another kind of ranking system, you might just say, oh, this guy's hurt. He's going to drop 30 spots because he's irrelevant. It's more he'll just sort of slowly decay, so to speak. So that's why Eli Manning's still hanging out in the bottom part of the list. Uh, yeah, and and that, that yeah, if we if we release the the rankings which we did in a blog post last week, you know, we're including anyone who's played in that three year time frame. So even I, in looking at rankings a, a couple weeks ago, I was seeing that you know there there are guys who are like on coaching staffs now that that are appearing on this list. So there's there's a little bit of funkiness there. 
for sure. How is it? How has the list sort of worked out? So in the long term, I want to ask you about the right now list, but you put together this system that that goes back a few years. So over the course of the seasons that that we have that data, how has the list played out? Who are the quarterbacks that have kind of dominated versus the bunch? To be clear, I guess I guess I want to talk a little bit about just sort of how it's calculated. We're using the total points structure, but because of the way that total points works as a calculation, it actually makes more sense to use its underlying statistic, which is points above average, which is just centered at zero, um, so that a, a positive game is positive and a negative game is negative. And the the kings of that in the early, quote, earlier days of total points were the Drew Breeses and Phil Rivers of the world, uh, to some extent, Matt Ryan as well. And we actually see that a little bit of sort of like an, an artifact of that in the rankings as we see them now, where those guys had really excellent seasons a couple of years ago, and they stick around on the top end of that list because they were so excellent in those seasons from a total points perspective. These days, you know, Mahomes obviously passed Drew Brees towards the end of last year, and uh, Wilson and Rogers, with excellent performances, especially this year, have sort of jumped up as well. That's a good point that you make. If you check it out on sportsinfosolutionsblog.com, you can find the rankings, and we'll be updating them throughout the season. Mark Simon's going to be working on that as well. But if you look at that, it is not in the scale of total points. We're looking at points above average, which is centered around zero, as Alex mentioned. So don't be alarmed if you see some some negative numbers on there and you're wondering what to make of them. All right. So then right now, uh, looking at the list, numbers one, two, and three, I love to argue, but I can't argue with the, the guys that are right there. The top three on the list right now, I don't have it uh, pulled up in front of me, but I think it was Mahomes, Wilson, and Rodgers. Is that right? Those guys are pretty good. Number four surprised me. Number four on the list right now, best quarterbacks in the world, is Derek Carr. What's going on there? Yeah, I I think we we got a bit of of flack at at the end of last year for having Rodgers as the number one quarterback from a total points perspective, and we kind of, I mean... To whatever extent you think this is wrong, we kind of get off the hook for uh, Derek Carr being a top five quarterback throughout a, a lot of last season as well. And he's, I think that we kind of think that he's had a pretty good season this year. And he's actually sort of improved relative to uh, what he did last year. What he did last year, which obviously counts as a part of the system, was perform excellently on third and fourth down. Uh, that was one thing that Mark mentioned in his write up last week. He was very good in terms of both volume and efficiency on third down. And when you're using an EPA-based metric, it's going to weight performance on those key downs a little bit more. And so even if you're just sort of average in other ways, if you're going to be excellent on those key plays, then you're going to look good from a from the perspective of this metric. And then also Carr has sort of continued that performance to be pretty good this season. Yeah, he has been good. I've been, you know, uh, I review because I saw him popping on the total points leaderboard. So I reviewed a couple of games of film on him. And I think that what the Raiders have done is really smart. He was very efficient, kind of, he's got the reputation as a dinker and dunker, but this is a guy with a big arm. He's got a ton of arm strength. They added some vertical weapons this year, including your boy Aguilar over from the, from the Eagles. But now with two real speed guys there, um, he certainly has got a good connection with Renfro. You see that they are able to take advantage of his arm strength a little bit more. And I think we're starting to see a Derek Carr who was not limited in his ability to throw down the field for any reason other than a lack of players that were going down the field for him and maybe an offense that didn't prefer that as much. You know, he's been a guy that gets a holds on, doesn't like to hold on to the ball very long. People say he doesn't like to get hit. I don't know. I'm not inside his brain. But I think certainly when you turn on the film, this isn't a case where I saw it and said, oh, well, this is garbage. Derek Carr, number four, what's going on here? When you actually look at him and, and you see the way that he's been playing, and it does date back to last year, this is a better quarterback than a lot of people give him credit for. Yeah, and, and you know, who could blame him for being a little bit quick-triggered considering he has a family history of getting destroyed from a sack perspective? So he could, he could be forgiven, I guess, for getting the ball out a little faster just because of what happened to his brother. Yeah, it's like uh, when you hear about like trauma b- being passed along through generations of families. Like I, you know, I didn't have to be alive during that horrible historical era, but I feel the scars of my ancestors. Yeah, um, and you could and you could have a similar. Yeah, it could it could all if you know if it were his son, I suppose it would also be like a, a reincarnation type thing. He was born <laughs> to, to remember that thing. Um, I'm still interested in the the alternate history of of David Carr. 
and what happens, you know, I think there are a bunch of quarterbacks that we could look at and say, man, if you went to a different situation, you would have had a really different career. All right. Last up, I want to I want to pick on a couple guys that are not in the top 10 that were a little bit further down. And I want to hear uh, what's what you make of of what the list is doing with Lamar Jackson and Big Ben Roethlisberger, those two AFC North quarterbacks, on really good teams. How come those guys couldn't crack the top 10? Sure. So I guess we'll talk about Roethlisberger first as a sort of elder statesman, so to speak. You might not be surprised to find out that in 2018, he was in the sort of back end of the top 10 type area uh, in the six to eight range for for a lot of the, the back end of the 2018 season. And then he starts 2019, doesn't necessarily have the uh, best start to the season and then misses the rest of the season with injury. And with a system like this, he's going to drop slowly over time. So as I'm looking at the list, he ends up at 14 rank before he gets hurt or the, you know, the game he gets hurt. And then he sort of slips and slips and slips and ends up in the thirties by the start of this season. And then he's been up and down to some extent. He's had pretty uh, good performance from his playmakers, which is sort of buoyed his performance. Obviously the the defense is also excellent. So the team performance around him has been a lot better as well. And he's been fine and he's sort of moved up into the, the low to mid twenties. But to some extent, that big, you know, that big chunk of time that you're missing is going to definitely affect your rankings. In terms of Lamar, he's an odd case because when he originally, you know, when he first was getting integrated into the Ravens offense, he wasn't even the starting quarterback. He was just getting a, a package here or there. From the perspective of our system, we're kind of ignoring performances like that. And uh, we think that, that the, especially because you're likely to get a big play here, a big play there because of the, the play design, guys who only make a couple appearances in a game, we're not really too worried about. So but, with Taysom Hill. Yeah, exactly. But once he started playing in 2018, even then, because total points takes into account things like fumbles, he had a lot of fumbles, even if he recovered a, you know, a decent amount of them. Fumbles from the perspective of total points are considered to be, we, we essentially consider them coin flips. And so we don't care if you lose or, or recover the fumble, we do care that you fumble. and. So in relatively limited, he had good rushing performance but from a passing perspective, had a lot of fumbles, and that sort of kept him down during that rookie campaign so that when he has the outstanding MVP level campaign, he's starting from a low enough level that he just couldn't quite get, he only got into the top 10 at the very end of, of last season. And then this season, you know, having a, a great performance to start the season gets you into that top 10, but then since then has not had a particularly great performance sort of being capped off by one of the worst performances of any quarterback this season in terms of total points last week. Well, one thing that I'll tease out as we finish up here is that I know there's an update you've been working on to total points that specifically addresses the run game. So we started collecting some new data and that allows us to do more accurate things with total points and to keep kind of narrowing our focus on all the little things. And I, and it seems that Lamar Jackson is going to be one of the big beneficiaries of the updates to the system. So we'll keep an eye on where he falls in on the list um, because it is something, this is best quarterback. It's not just best passer. And I think a combination of him getting more time in there, we'll see him crawling up the list slowly, but surely. All right, Alex, thank you so much for coming on. And we will be keeping an eye on the list at sports info solutions, blog.com as the updates come throughout the season. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the listeners. As a reminder, please rate, review, and tell your friends about the Off the Charts Football Podcast. You can check out footballoutsiders.com for all of their outstanding content. Aaron, what are the people looking at today? Well, like I talked about, Film Room uh, is about the Colts throwing to their uh, running backs. Walkthrough has, uh, you're going to want to read Mike Tanier's thoughts about Antonio Brown. And the scramble for the ball this week gave out mid-season or almost mid-season awards. Ten-year article last week with all of the, I forget what he called it, but the, the elders of the teams. The meeting of the elders of the rivalry. Um, it, was, it was perfection, really. You can check out Aaron also. He's on Twitter at FB Outsiders and at FO underscore A Shots. Sports Info Solutions is on Twitter at Sports Info underscore SIS. I'm at Matt Mano, M-A-T-T-M-A-N-O. And as a reminder, you can check out the free SIS Data Hub by checking out sisdatahub.com. You can see the advanced stats there, total points, blown blocks, all that fun stuff. 
For my co-host, Aaron Schatz, and our producer, Justin Stein, I'm Matt Manicharian, and thank you for joining us for the latest episode of the Off the Charts Football Podcast.